Chinese launch companies are making significant progress in their pursuit to develop reusable rockets. These are companies, for the most part, founded in the past 10 years and funded by a mix of private, municipal, and provincial venture capital. These startups are strongly supported by the Chinese government as their new launch capability will be essential to bring down the cost of launching to space and massively scaling up China's launch capacity to deploy the future Starlink-like Xinguang and Qianfan mega constellations. So in this video, let's deep dive into the eight most promising Chinese launch startups, review their similarities and differences, and discuss the path to their maiden launches. China's eight most promising reusable rocket companies are Landspace, iSpace, Galactic Energy, Caspace, Space Pioneer, Orion Space, Deep Blue Aerospace, as well as SAST. Each of these companies is actively developing a reusable rocket, with a payload capacity generally situated between 12 tons and 22 tons, with the exception of Deep Blue Aerospace, which is first developing a reusable small lift launch vehicle, the Nebula 1. Technology wise, they are also quite similar. Almost all of them are adopting a Falcon 9-like approach with a two-stage architecture, a reusable first stage equipped with seven or nine rocket engines, and with recovery relying, among other things, on grid fins and landing legs. But as we look closer, differences begin to emerge. Architecture-wise, Caspace is doing things a little bit differently. The Legion 2 has two side boosters, which don't separate from the core stage. They stay as a single block during the entire landing phase, with grid fins and landing legs situated on the core stage, but also on the boosters. For their engines, Landspace, Icebase, and SAST have opted to go for liquid methane and oxygen as their propellants, putting forward the cleaner combustion it produces, which is key for reusability. Galactic Energy, Caspace, Orion Space, Space Pioneer, and Deep Blue Aerospace have chosen, on the other hand, kerosene and liquid oxygen, a much more mature propellant combo which has been in use in rocket engines for over half a century. All these companies are going for gas generator cycle rocket engines, a less efficient but more simple architecture, which can be a major advantage when looking to reuse the same engine multiple times. For most of these rocket companies, the engines have been developed internally, especially since in the early years of Chinese commercial space, there were few options to source engines externally. But as the Chinese commercial space sector grew in maturity, commercial engine manufacturers have emerged, and some recent rocket projects like those from SAST and Caspace are buying engines off the shelf, therefore skipping one of the most lengthy tasks in rocket design. Now, making reusable rockets is a capital-intensive business. A lot of money is coming from venture capital funds, but relying exclusively on venture capital can only get you so far. And this is why out of these eight rocket companies, seven already have regular launch income thanks to smaller expendable rockets developed separately and already in service. Two of these rockets are liquid-fueled, while the others are solid-fueled. I'm setting aside, of course, SAST, which makes the Long March rockets and operates in a completely different league. The annual number of launches of these small expendable rockets have been low single digit figures, and only Galactic Energy stands out here with an impressive number of Series 1 launches. These launches bring a welcome inflow of cash, enabling these companies to rely less on investor money. But these smaller rockets are catering for a relatively niche market. The real cash cow is going to be their heavy lift reusable rockets, which are generally scheduled to launch for the first time either in 2025 or 2026. Now let's review all of the vertical takeoff, vertical landing attempts of these companies. But before we do that, just a quick word from our partner Surfshark, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. I'm currently at the airport on my way home and I've been traveling a lot lately. And one thing that's been absolutely essential to keep my workflow smooth, regardless of where I am, is a reliable VPN. Now, there are two reasons, in my opinion, why you would want to use a VPN. The first one is if you're like me, you're concerned about safety issues when using the internet. What a VPN does is that it masks your device's IP address, encrypting it and routing it through secure networks, 
hiding your online identity and protecting your data. And this is typically very useful if you use public Wi-Fi networks. Another big reason to use a VPN is that you can choose the country of the server you're routing your data through. And this is super helpful, for example, when you're doing research, because quite a few websites will actually block you based on the country of origin of your IP. And I've definitely experienced this many times when doing research on space related topics. This also applies to other applications like games, like streaming platforms or social media. Now, I've been using Surfshark for a couple of months, and I can say that they have an impressive product. They work with over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, ensuring that you always get the fastest, most optimal connection based on your location. There's no restrictions on the number of devices, so you can connect as many as you want. And if you have any trouble setting all of this up, they have a 24-7 customer support. So if you travel a lot or often use the internet in public spaces, give Surfshark VPN a try. I'm convinced that it can secure and fluidify your online experience. You can get a trial and get four months free at surfshark.com slash hour. And don't forget the slash hour because that's what gets you the exclusive four months free. And of course, it helps support the channel, which makes videos like these possible. Thank you, Surfshark, for supporting the channel. And with that, back to Chinese reusable rockets. Now, to achieve rocket reusability, experimenting with prototypes is key. The first such experiments in China date back to 2018 and 2019 from a company called Linkspace, which ultimately led to the launch of the RLV T5, a small prototype powered by ethanol and liquid oxygen, and which rose 300 meters in the air before landing. Unfortunately for Linkspace, the company is rumored to have had serious management and funding problems and hasn't been very active since. The next step up came from Deep Blue Aerospace and their Nebula M demonstrator around 2021 and 2022. This was still a tiny prototype, barely seven meters tall, but powered by a much more sophisticated Lating 5 Kerlox engine powered by electrical pumps. After some lower altitude hops in 2021, the Nebula M reached the altitude of one kilometer in May 2022, successfully controlling the stability of the rocket by gimbling the engine, achieving horizontal movements, and performing a soft landing. But the real breakthroughs begin the following year. In November 2023, iSpace debuted the Hyperbola 2Y, a much more sophisticated prototype and taller by a factor of 2.5, and this time actually using engines designed for orbital flights. In other words, the 15-ton thrust methlox fueled Jiaodian-1 engine. In December of 2023, the Hyperbola 2Y reached an altitude of 343 meters and demonstrated landing on a different location from the initial launch pad. Six months later, the Shanghai Academy of Space Technology, aka SAST, put its own unnamed prototype into action. This prototype went another step further. It used three much more powerful Longin 70 ton thrust methlox field engines and had a diameter of 3.8 meters. It reached the so far unprecedented altitude in China of 12 kilometers, performed a shutdown of two engines in flight, and for the very first time put into action deployable landing legs, as you can see here. In parallel, Landspace was beginning its own flight experiments with the vertical takeoff vertical landing demonstrator of their own called the Jutra 3 VTVL-1. This is a similar sized demonstrator compared to iSpace and SAST, using this time the in-house developed 80-ton thrust TQ-12 Methlox engine, which are the engines that will power the future Jutra 3 rocket. The prototype debuted in January of 2024. On its second flight in September 2024, it reached an altitude of 10 kilometers and performed the first in-flight full engine cutoff, enabling the rocket to be fully controlled by grid fins. This was followed by an engine secondary ignition at an altitude of 4.6 kilometers, also a new milestone in Chinese rocketry. Now, worth noting, the Jutra 3 VTVL-1 is made of stainless steel, which is a material that Landspace also plans to use for the orbital version of the Jutra 3. Now, finally, just a few weeks ago in late September 2024, Deep Blue Airspace tested the Nebula 1 first stage. 
This was no longer some demonstrator. This was a production version of an actual rocket first stage. Now, while the first stage of the Nebula 1 is supposed to be equipped with nine Leyting R1 Kerlox engines, for this first test, only three engines were installed. This test reached a maximum altitude of 10 kilometers, saw the deployment of landing legs, but no active use of grid fins. According to Deep Blue Aerospace, only 10 of the 11 objectives of this test were a success. The remaining 11th was about performing a soft landing, but which did not take place as planned due to a miscontrol of the terminal velocity leading to an explosion. Now, what comes next? Things will probably only accelerate from here. iSpace plans to perform a sea-based landing with a hyperbola 2Y by the end of 2024. Deep Blue Aerospace wants to perform an 100 km altitude test as soon as November of 2024, and SAST plans a 70 km altitude flight also by the end of this year. As for land space, I'm not sure when the next tests will be, but we know that they plan the first orbital launch of their Jutra 3 heavy lift rocket in June 2025, and that a first stage recovery will be attempted on the maiden launch. Now, interestingly, some of the other rocket companies I've mentioned earlier, like Space Pioneer or Orion Space, haven't made as much progress on having their own VTVL demonstrators. But the maiden launch of their heavy lift rockets are still scheduled within the next 12-ish months. And this brings me to my next point, which is that all these Chinese reusable rockets will generally start out as expendable rockets and will only be progressively recovered and reused over time. Some players like Deep Blue Aerospace, with all the experience accumulated with BTVL, will probably achieve reusability very quickly, I suspect within the first three orbital launches of the Nebula 1. Others may take more time in their attempt to recover their first stage, and for example, in the case of Caspace, they foresee that the first Legion to rocket recovery will only occur around 2028. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, because while building a reusable rocket is definitely an impressive feat that's going to get a lot of international attention, I feel like an even bigger priority for Chinese control launch companies is to get these rockets to launch reliably ASAP, even if they are expendable and that reusable will only come a few years later. Launching earlier will bring them a welcome inflow of cash and help alleviate the growing bottleneck that China is facing in launch. And finally, as some viewers familiar with Chinese space may have noted, there's one rocket that I haven't mentioned yet, which is the Long March 10. The Long March 10 is China's future super heavy lift launch vehicle being developed for China's lunar program and to launch heavier spacecraft to the Chinese space station. This rocket will be human rated and has a CBC architecture with a payload capacity similar to the Falcon Heavy. Now, I have a full episode on China's crewed lunar mission in 2030, covering specifically the Long March 10. So check that out if you want to know all the nitty gritty details. But in a nutshell, the Long March 10 will be available in two versions. You'll have a single stick Long March 10A and a heavier Long March 10 with two boosters, both scheduled to launch for the first time around 2027. The first stage and boosters are designed to be recovered at sea, using an interesting tethered system to catch returning rocket parts in midair. And finally, just to wrap all this up, I want to say that I've been watching the Chinese space sector for the past seven years, and reusable rockets have always been a hot topic. But this is the first time that we are truly on the brink of seeing it become a reality. There are voices that legitimately question if China needs this many rocket companies or this many reusable rockets, but I would argue that China has planned two mega constellations, which are Qinfan and Xinguang, amounting respectively to 15,000 and 13,000 satellites. And these need to be launched into low Earth orbit within the next 10 years, probably representing over 150 launches annually. And this is excluding all the other launches coming from the rest of China's space program. The Chinese launch bottleneck is real, and new players in the industry are desperately needed to meet targets. But whether that means two or three or eight commercial rocket companies remains to be seen. And finally, as always, I want to say a special thank you to my patrons on Patreon.com and YouTube memberships. Thank you so much for supporting the channel on the long term and making videos like this one possible. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.